there, Glocal Citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around manifesting a new world. I am your host, Florence Adu, coming to you from Brooklyn. I'm still here, guys. Enjoying the winter as I only can in the small doses. And speaking of winter, I had a really interesting journey in terms of meeting my guests for today because I took a trip to the big sky and it found a brotherhood that I think is going to be long lived. And that is in my guest for today. So his introduction is going to be quite brief, but our conversation will go into so much depth into who this person is and how he came to be here in the US. He is the founder and owner of the 406 AM crew, which is all about positivity through fitness. And I think that's a great segue into the conversation. I think it's a great intro to Gabriel Ansa. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Gabe, let's just jump right in because I purposefully leave out a lot of details that a lot of people have in their in their bios so that we could have them as part of the conversation. So let's start first with where are you from? Where are you local? And what is your craft? I'm from Ghana, West Africa, but I live in Missoula, Montana, and I'm a fitness trainer. Let's talk a little bit more about Ghana because everyone knows I'm from Ghana, so we always like to get a little bit deeper. So where is your hometown in Ghana? Yeah, my home, I grew up in Tema, which is outside of Accra. Lived in Ghana, Tema for 17 years before I moved to the U.S. So you spent your formative years being a young man, a young boy to man in uh, in Tema. Which community in Tema were you in? I was at Community 8. You know, sometimes go into a little bit of a description of how Tema came to be and how, you know, just the lay of the land is. So yeah. in terms of Community 8 in Tema, you know, there's there's now 25 communities. I'm in, I'm in 19. So there is a part of Tema that is more like, I call it Accra annexed because it's kind of on, it's closer to Accra. But the proper first, I think it was first 10 communities in Tema were all kind of arranged around industry and around serving, well, creating industry. So can you tell us a little bit of background on, on that and your experience growing up in Tema? Yeah, growing up, my mom actually worked in a chocolate factory over there. So you were right, there's a lot of factories around. I feel like we grew up in the chocolate factory. We we'll always go there and go visit her and we get little treats of chocolate here and there all the time. So that was always an incentive too. And that's where they, they had their own hospital there as well. So every time we're sick, we're able to go there and get taken care of. That's an interesting point that you make because I know a number of my friends who grew up in Tema, their parents' institutions had um, like wraparound services. So the hospital was there, so they got all of their services. So was your mom's company, It was a, was it a multinational company or was it a Ghanaian company? I'm pretty, it was a Ghanaian company. It was Coco Processing Company. But yeah, they had the multi-purpose. So we were, we were pretty fortunate to be able to just go to one place where mom worked and see a doctor and the whole bundle was in one. So I remember that vividly always because we got sick a lot. Well, you're healthy now. That's good to know. <laughs> yes. So I feel like we're always there, which is, which is not bad. So then let's talk about your craft. So you are a fitness instructor. Tell us more about how you came to even be in that space. Yeah, yeah. This was out of nowhere. I I moved here 19 years ago as a high school exchange student. I didn't even know Missoula, Montana was a place or a state. I didn't even know. I just knew about I was coming to the United States. Uh, when I heard about the exchange program, I didn't know exactly where. Um, you know you come to the States, but you don't know what state you're going to end up in. So when I got my itinerary, I said I was coming to Missoula, Montana. And I literally had to Google what, what Missoula, Montana was. So yeah, more, I just went with it because I knew it would be a way better opportunity for me than being in Ghana. It's funny we say this because I just talked to my brother when I just went, went back home in December. And he talk, my parents always talked about how... I didn't even aspire to travel. Growing up as a kid was tough enough. So I I was just growing up without a goal. I felt like I was growing up without a purpose because, so to speak, I wasn't very motivated to go to school. And growing up, I don't know if you had the same experience, but if you're not uh, the most motivated person in school or not the smartest kid in school, it's tough to go to school because you actually don't get the help you need. And I can go back on that even because, yeah, you care to ask questions, 
you get make fun of teachers don't like you because you can't read or write which parents should be the opposite because kids like myself should be the ones getting all the help not the kids who already know all that so yeah i had no aspirations of even doing anything yeah this program just started and came to my high school I remember a bunch of my friends actually told me I should apply for it and tell my parents about it. I wasn't even interested because, yeah, from what we're dealing with nowadays, people putting you down, people telling you you're not good enough. That was me as a kid, so I just didn't do anything. Friends telling me to do it, I talked to my dad about it, and at that time, uh, my dad just landed a decent job and able to afford it to send me out for that program. I talked I talked about my mom a while, a while ago. She had to retire from that chocolate factory to be able afford to get his her retirement to pay for this trip for me. That's how this thing came about. It was a lot to her and my friends. So yeah, I, I, I guess I got motivated to just leave the country and see if I can find something else myself. So you are a young man from the tropics, never, you weren't really aspiring, but she said, okay, well, I'm just going to get plucked here in this yeah. big United States. First day, Missoula, I'm sure you arrived in the summer, but how was that first year? Like, how did you acclimate yourself? <laughs> Let me just just break in. So I went to Montana and Missoula for the first time a few weeks ago. And part of the um, impetus for that is that I have a nephew that plays basketball for the University of Montana. And that's how I came to meet Gabriel. So we had that sports and fitness connection. So Missoula, everyone knows I also grew up in Colorado, so it wasn't so far off for me to like see mountains and understand the snow and all of those things. So I just am very curious about, you know, your first impressions of the place that you now reside. So I actually got here in September, so the weather was fairly decent. It was just cold in the mornings, but not too bad. I remember vividly. It was it was on a Sunday uh, where we got our first snow. I was getting ready to go to church with my host family who I still speak to and talk to. And they, I, she, she screamed, Gabriel, come upstairs. So I went upstairs and it was white everywhere. I mean, and like, I am not going out there. I told her. Nothing is slow in my life. Um, nothing. And I said, I'm not going out there. She said, no, you have to go. It's, it's really okay. So I stepped and I remember just brushing the snow off of me. I'm like, this needs to get off me. And she's like, no, oh, this is fine. It's just going to melt. And that was my first experience of the snow. I was very fortunate to live with that host family because my host mom is very outdoorsy. And so she she was very good about introducing me to just embracing it and just loving it for what it is. Yeah, that is good. That is That was a good soft landing to the snow culture. Yeah. Yeah, she was great for that purpose and a, and a lot of other things too. I still t- keep in touch with her um, she, every Wednesday and take him to her house and play. And like a local grandma. She's a local grandma. She's our grandma. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. nice. She did open my eyes to a, a lot of it. I also remember just, I hated wearing jackets. I hated wearing sweatshirts. I hated wearing coats. And it's a big issue. And she's like, oh, you're going you're gonna to have to wear yeah. this. <laughs> you're going to learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm still not used to wearing layers. But what I do now, I'm always indoors. So uh, you might see me a t-shirt with in the winter. Yeah. So, but yes, I had to I had to get used to all that. And I um I even have a backstory. So when I got to New York City when I was flying here, even though I knew I was coming to Missoula, Montana, I seriously didn't think I was actually coming here. I thought I was just going to New York. So Oh, okay. I was almost exiting the airport and one of the directors said, You're not you're not here yet. Like you still are, you still you still have two flights to go. I'm like, wait, that's not right because my uncle lives here. So I thought, (laughs) yeah, that was a big old deal. Yeah. Then that didn't happen. So we flew to Salt Lake. Then we got there. Then uh, missed our connection. I was by myself by then. All split up in New York. There was five of us. Then I didn't know what to do because I never traveled before. I never seen an airplane up until. Right, right, right. And I stayed up all night, walked around Salt Lake Airport all night because I was scared I was going to miss my connection. Right, of course. So that's that was my night in Salt Lake. I pretty much walked around the entire night. The next day came, boarded the plane, then flew to Missoula, and all I saw was just mountains everywhere. And yeah. I'm like this is not right. <laughs> this is. This is not- <laughs> oh gosh! 
U.S. is not the U.S. So we landed. My host family was actually out of town. So one of the area coordinators here picked me up from the airport, mm -hmm. went to her house. Then my host family came. So they came and picked me up. Then to make matters worse, now that I can say that, they live up. It's called O'Brien Creek. So you literally have to drive up a mountain for a mile. Oh, wow. It's around the mountain. So you have kind of the peak where you're yeah. looking down. Okay. That, yeah. Your warehouse, you look down yeah. and see the city. Yeah. That's how. So we drive way up in the mountains and I'm like freaking out the whole time. <laughs> Something's <is> wrong. <laughs> There's no way it's happening. <laughs> we finally pull up and yeah, she has a house over there. And yeah, it was all, it was all, it was all great after. I mean, I called my mom and I said, this, I think they made a mistake. I wasn't supposed to come here. This is not the U.S. And I just went on and on. Uh -huh. and, well, I don't think they made a mistake. It's just very different. So, right. I tell you it's different. Every single thing was different. I mean, not yeah. was ever the same. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's when the, you know, the becoming my own person started. Mm -hmm. Embrace mm -hmm. what you got. And I've just looked at the bright side. And that's what my mom told me. Just look at the bright side. And just be positive every day. And that's all I did. So that's how this whole 406 thing started. I was going to have a brand back then, but being someone who should look on the bright side and staying positive, that's how it started. Because I actually seriously thought I was in, in the worst case scenario, like the mm -hmm. worst thing ever happened. Mm -hmm. You were lost, basically. You felt lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Because it, when we talk about cultural shock. That was cultural shock to the max. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. So you've kind of talked about the why the where with the exchange program, but 19 years later, you're still living in Missoula. So give us a little bit of understanding on why the where. So how did you come to be living, working and playing where you currently now find yourself in Missoula? So, yeah, I did. After the exchange program, through the exchange, mm -hmm. I actually met a girl I'm um, in high school mm -hmm. and we kind of hung out for a little bit. But went back after the exchange program, then I was also fortunate to apply for college before I left. Mm, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know, but it is back then it was nearly impossible to come back to the U.S. when yeah. you've left after an exchange program. So I, I applied for the U.S. I applied to come back for college. Two months later, I got a four-year visa to come back to college, back to Ghana. So I was two months late for school. For some reason, I got the visa. Nobody still knows why. So I got a four-year visa. I came back. And the first class I, I went into, pretty much, I met the same girl I met in high school. Oh, wow. So that's okay. That's Keisha. That's my wife for 13 years now. We've been together about 16 years. Wow. So, yeah, I met her in the first class I went to. We hung out. And, you know, it's all history after that. The college for um, information systems. Also didn't know I was going to be a fitness trainer. I just went to college just to go to college. Yeah. My advice always told me, just find something you kind of like. So I'm like, mm. oh, I kind of mm. like computers, so I'll do that. Okay. And I was still lost. I was still trying to figure yeah. it out. And being in college was tough because the Ghanaian currency and the U.S. currency is so different. Yes. The U.S. currency is so much higher in Ghana. Uh, Twitter yes. tough. I don't... I mean, you would know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like, yeah. you know, I came here with $4,000 and one one suitcase. That's how I moved to yeah. the US. Uh, $4,000. Yeah. I mean, it's a lifetime in Ghana. It's a lot of money in Ghana. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So exactly. I came here thinking that was tuition for the year. No, that, and that was not even tuition for a week. One semester. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's like, how do I live? Yeah. How do you... yeah. yeah so, so tell us about that. Like, so... You had the exchange program, and then you you got a visa. But did you get a scholarship? Did you like how did you work out the finances? I think I had like a fifteen hundred dollars scholarship. Then um, the international. And you were an international student. You you your being an exchange student didn't allow you to be an in state student. No, no. Okay. Yeah, wow. College is still international. And I believe it was like twenty one thousand for the year. So I I just worked as much as I can. All, uh -huh. all end jobs and just met a bunch of good people that helped me along the way. And, okay. Uh, in the summers, you are, you are allowed to work even more. I just worked and worked and worked and just paid through school. And I mean, looking back, I mean, I don't even know how I did it. Uh, I couldn't, <laughs> I just, I just kept my head down. Just knew I, I was here for a reason. And sure. if I didn't do that, there was no way I was going to stay here. 
Yeah. So I yeah. and I mean up to now, I mean I don't tell a lot of people this, but I would literally wake up every night with nightmares thinking I was getting deported because I didn't know I was gonna be able to afford tuition. But you have to leave the country. Yeah. That's a real fear. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, real fear. Yeah. So that was my driving force, I would say. That drove me to get up every day and just work. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it wasn't easy, but I got through it. Just met Keisha through that too. And we got married at some point. After five years, we got married. Then I got a little bit of financial aid to finish school. But that was towards the end. So you eased up a little bit, but you still had to. But yeah, you have a lot of challenges to deal with when you're a foreign student. Yeah. You can only work certain hours. You can only work at this specific place. Exactly. A lot of restrictions. So yeah, I just yeah. Kept, the, kept my head up and just, just kept working. And hmm. I just got along the way. So how does someone who majored in information systems then become this fitness guru? Because, so, yeah, uh, so, so take us on the journey to the 406 AM yeah. crew. Yeah, so my when we got pregnant with Kingston, who is my oldest, he's, eight, he's nine in July mm-hmm. now. My wife and I will get up because she can sleep. So we would just literally get up early and go work out every day. Okay. Every morning we'll go work out. Every morning we'll go work out. And throughout that journey... I did meet a guy through soccer who actually believed in me and said, hey, you're a really good soccer player. Have you ever thought about trying out to play soccer? And I'm like, I haven't. So I started just putting my craft, putting that practice in. So I did my first semi-pro tryout in D.C. Oh, wow. Okay. Pretty much made the team, but the coaches told me I was too small. I was 155 pounds, very lanky. I get in the gym, take it serious, and come back. So that okay. was driving force. So I got in the gym after that while I was going to school and mm-hmm. started working out um, for that purpose. Then uh, along the way, I just fell in love with it. I just I just got up and did it every day. Mm-hmm. And through that, when you become obsessed with something, you put in the time and the work. So I did a couple of classes on it. I did all the research. I just went as far as I could go with it. Then I just couldn't stop. <laughs> to say. I went back the following year and I made that team. And I just like, this actually works, you know, okay. if yeah. on the ultimate results and if you would put in the work, you can actually achieve it. So that really motivated me to even go even harder. Yeah. So we worked out and at this same time, I was still working out with wifey uh-huh. and we just kept it going. And our gym over here opens at six. So in the beginning, I just called it. And this, this is a custom shirt I'm wearing for my kids. I call this. 6 a.m. crew because we'll go work out at 6 a.m. Yes. Then I will always post something inspirational. So I get to the gym, I'll take a picture of the clock. And then I'll post, let's have an amazing day, some super basic. And I got a couple comments, people telling me, this is very cool. It helps me get up in the morning. And I'm like, oh, man, if that helped one person, then maybe I should keep doing it. So for the last nine years, I've done it every single day for nine, nine ten years. Wake up wow. the morning do something inspirational. And from that, people started sharing it. Then I'm like, well, Missoula has been awesome to me. So I want to incorporate Missoula. So I added the four zero. So I made it four zero six. And four zero six is Missoula area code. The A okay. crew is just the morning crew. So the word got out and I made one shirt and um, someone bought it. So I'm like, oh, okay, maybe I'll make more. So I made, I made a shirt and someone bought it. So I'm like, oh, okay, so we can do something with this. So that's how the, the brand pretty much started. So the brand started and I never shared a workout or had a social media or anything. I mean, I just had the, just did the story, but I never shared workouts. Okay. A buddy of mine, Ross, over here, just like, dude, you should post a workout because the stuff you do is actually cool. Mm-hmm. That was a comfortable thing for me to ever do because I, I was just stuck in my shell. I just, I just didn't have the confidence to post. You know, I just wanted to just stay in the little bubble and just keep pumping inspirational words out there. And so I shared a workout and the next day I shared another one. Then the next day I shared another one and um, I started getting the following. Okay. Just by. Right. So, yeah, I kept it going and I uh, have a IG, pretty good following of people that just say what I do inspires them and motivates them to get up in the morning and to work out. So that's how 406 kind of came about. Um, and even that, I didn't even know I wanted to be a trainer. I, ju- I was just doing it for the love of it, you know. Uh-huh. People work out with me at the gym because they know I'll be there. 
So they will, people will just show up, and I just said, just show up and come work out. So people would just set up stations and we just work out. And so it was a fun little thing we did. Then the word kept getting out. Then people kept showing up. Then people kept showing up. And I did that for six years and trained people for six years. Didn't charge anybody a dime. Wow. Pro bono. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Just did that for six straight years. And I just started getting paid to train people as of two years ago. Wow. Okay, so w- while you're being this Gymstagrammer, I just came up with that. I don't know if that's a real thing, but yeah. I think it's a Gymstagrammer. <laughs> Um, so while you're doing that, how are you surviving? How are you providing for your family? How are you yeah. doing it? it for the university. So I was working for UM Housing. Okay. We we owned all the living spaces on campus. So I had okay. to come through that. So I'm worried about uh, making a living because I, was, I just love how people feel so good about themselves after they come and work out with me. I just find it giving back is so rewarding. And the joy I feel from that, it's more than what I make in what, what I make in my paycheck. You know, I get sure. to pay the bills, but I don't feel that much joy. I get the joy when I see a smile on people's face and they tell me, thank you for training right. me and all this. And the results. Yeah. The results. Yeah. So that was the driving force. Then, then at some point, I'm like, I actually really love this and I can see myself doing it. So I just, I just jumped the gun and met the right people and just doing it full time now. Mm-hmm. Nice. I still get up at four. So now with the brand, I'm so addicted to the brand. I wake up at four zero six every day. <laughs> it's about thirty. Okay. Wow. That's that's dedication. That's passion. That's love. Then we start training. Yeah, it's it's love. I mean, I always heard the cool how like you know if you find something you love to do, you don't feel like you're it's at work. Never work. Yeah. Never feel like I'm at yeah. work. I'm here all. You know. My, I, I don't call my clients. I call my fit crew. They show up ah. and maybe it's finishing up a email or something. They'll always say, oh, we thought you actually weren't going to be here. <laughs> yeah. When you pull up, you see my truck. I'm always here. I just love doing what I'm doing. And my kids love being here. You know, it's even it's even awesome. I bring one weekends. So weekends, I, yeah. I bring wifey in. Yeah, and work out and just play around and just have a, have a good time in the gym. Yeah. So fit family vibes. That's the way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the goal. So and yeah, everyone's into fitness now. So yeah. it's been awesome. It's been it's been a joy to to be able to just create something. I still can't believe it. I actually created something where people you you go everywhere. You're like you know you're the four six guy. You're the guy that does all the crazy workouts. Ah, okay. You're local celebrity. Celebrity, but I just people people like the vibe. So I just go with it. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this. This is where I go into global speak. And so we want to hear what you hear. And, you know, kind of with the brand, you have your 406 AM crew. That's kind of uh, some kind of a little bit of a, a saying, but we want to hear what you hear. So I ask you to share a word, a phrase or a saying that is a meaningful part of your local experience and how or why you come to value it as global speak. There's one quote cool I I mean, wifey always said, and it, it just really resonates with me. Um, it doesn't matter what time you show up. You just show up and do it for yourself and try to enjoy doing it as well. Mm-hmm. That's like a saying for 406. And just through this journey, I just really preach, especially I work with a, young, a lot of young athletes. Mm-hmm. Just believe in yourself, know your worth, know how good you are. Because mm-hmm. I know how good I was. So someone told me I was good at soccer. Then mm. here for me to get the ultimate confidence. So I preach that a lot. Let them know how good they are because nowadays with social media, which is good in a lot of ways for us, but also toxic for a lot of ways for us. You know, people don't tell you how good you are. People try to tear you down. I yeah. get that one bright light here to tell. Kids. Yeah. And I, I always say kids because I want to cater to kids. Tell them how good they are. And mm-hmm. when you know your worth and you know how good you are, it doesn't matter what someone else tells you. You know, nobody can touch your your soul. Nobody can touch your peace of mind when you know how good you are. So just because your friends say you're ugly or your your shirt doesn't look good, you know it looks good on you. So why are you going to worry about it? You know? Yeah. So I, I really want to be, you know, and I've taken on that role that I want to help kids know their worth and just don't let people tell you you're not good enough because mm-hmm. you're actually. So, and I use that with my workouts. That's why I come up with all these impossible workouts. Mm-hmm. It's impossible, but when you come here and actually try it, you can do mm-hmm. it. 
So we build confidence in the gym. Mm-hmm. And that's something I really want to keep doing and help people with that. It sounds a lot like your childhood really shaped the man that you are because you know, in saying that, you know, you grew up and you didn't have a lot of praise in the classroom and with teachers. And so you just felt like you were kind of out there. And so you're really reversing that by being that vocal advocate and support system for a lot of people who may may have been experiencing things similar to you. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah. And we didn't have social media back then or anything. But yes, sure. the way he says, I mean, like education kind of back then was teachers would come to class with, you know, with the stick. Mm-hmm. And of course, you got a question wrong you get beat for it, which is, you know, the last thing you want to do because I don't want to show up because I know I'll get beat. I was actually, I'm going to go back story real quick. I was born left, mm. but forward. Mm-hmm. And kindergarten teacher thought it was bad to be a lefty. So I would get beat every single day when I went to school. That's where it started. Mm-hmm. It switched me to a righty. So I've always hated, we call it cane, the stick. Every time I saw the stick, it always scared me. And I believe I was maybe in my youngest age, which is four. Yeah. So from that, I just didn't like school because I school always reminded me of pain. Getting abused, yeah, getting abused, how it started for me. And I didn't realize this till a couple of years ago, why I actually didn't like school till I moved to the U.S. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was still the same kid that supposedly didn't know anything. But when I went to school here, I was thriving in school because... Teachers were actually willing to help me. They would spend an extra hour with you outside of class to go through everything she just talked about in class, and it wasn't even a big deal. You know, they loved me. Um, so that's also one of my mission to be able to go back to Ghana and go talk to schools. I'm, I'm sure things have changed tremendously, and I've heard, but um, just keep bringing that awareness because kids like myself needed an extra help from teachers not the other way around, not the kids who actually had to figure it right. out. Right, yeah. Help them, kids like myself that actually needed the help. So I just want to keep advocating for kids like myself. And I know there's a lot. Like- Absolutely. I mean, in my work in Ghana, I'm sad to say that it's changed, but not across the board. I mean, there's still, particularly in the public school system, you still have a lot of the same kind of mentality. You know, it's still shunned to be a lefty. You know, they're still yeah. doing those types of I want to say colonial types of behaviors that that are really impacting the the future minds of our country, and so kids' minds are so fragile, and they're actually but and that's when we absorb everything, you know. I yeah. That because I have kids, and I've seen how much they can absorb at the young age. Exactly. So being hit every single oh, day, gosh. I remember vividly every day where how it actually happened, and now I'm now I write righty. Yeah. And luckily, actually, I have good writing for writing, so I take it, you know. Yeah, right. But it was a painful journey. <laughs> it was a painful journey, you know, but I just don't want to limit kids from being a lefty or, you know, kicking away or walking a certain way. It's okay to, you know, to be exactly what you are and don't let people tell you it's wrong to do something, but, you know. And I would say if you're doing something that makes you happy and you're not hurting anybody, don't let anyone tell you it's wrong. So this is a great segue into some of your actual community work and you're working in the community. So you had an exciting trip this last December that was part of a whole campaign and you really were leveraging your brand to do that. So tell us about your recent uh, sojourn to Ghana. Yeah. So yeah, my trip to Ghana was awesome. Quick backstory before the whole thing happened. Through 406 and through helping the community and the kids, I became a Blue Lemon Ambassador. So I'm the Lululemon ambassador here in Missoula, and I would say through the partnership with Lulu, they have been so gracious and you know willing and you know very very giving. So through them, it was a big part where we did a fundraise to raise funds to go help the youth soccer in Ghana in Tema. Mm-hmm. So we did a fundraising here. Lululemon sponsored it all. We had about. 60 to 70 people show up and we hiked the mountain here and raised over two thousand dollars with that i bought we got soccer clays we got soccer balls we got soccer equipment we had the local ymca here donate a bunch of jerseys a local soccer club here missoula surf donated a bunch of soccer shorts socks shin guards and just spread the word out to the missoula community that i was taking stuff back to go help the kids over there so I traveled to Ghana back in December, 
with five suitcases of worth um, soccer gear and clothes and jerseys everything's up nice and went back did a charity game with the kids and adults about i want to say maybe 100 people show up fed everybody played soccer and just give out the equipment just make sure every kid got something for christmas yeah that's awesome yeah that was the exciting thing we did in ghana so and the goal is to be able to do it every other year kind of fundraise here then okay. just go back and just give back and i'm trying to choose different villages every time I go back, but they're worth it a little bit. Nice. That stuff, I mean, stuff we don't take for granted right here. It means so much to them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's really these like small grassroots pieces, like you said, like just to know that someone thought of you at a young age yeah. will just be that spark of inspiration that, you know, creates the next big philanthropist or something to that nature. Yeah. Yeah. The domino effect. And when I got yeah. a bunch of bracelets, that's a 406 on and some of the older kids follow me on social media now and they was you know checking on me and telling me thank you for doing that and you know i just i just want to be a mentor to these, to these kids and like say hey, if you have any question just let me know and yeah i just exchange your messages to kids i just met there so i think it's yeah cool for them to you know. to have a connection so so that so they know a different united states than new york or california so they actually yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> The United States is not just New York or Washington, D.C. Yeah, there's a lot of in-between. <laughs> and I did go to New York after I did my exchange program, and I just knew it wasn't for me. I, I hear people here are amazing. I mean, they, yeah. everything. There's a reason why I'm still here, you know. I can say that I really, I, I mean, I would love to go back in the summer, you know, just the fresh air, clean water, yeah. you know. It's just, it's just, it's a different experience, so. Summer's amazing. You have to experience summer here. You know, they call them the snowbirds. So they retire. Yes. They live here. They will leave in the winter, but they are right back in May. Ah, Sabah. right. Summers right. Are, summers are great. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, just the city, there's great trails and, and the river walk. It's a, it's a really special place, I would say. It is a special place. And it just takes someone to come visit to actually yeah. see. Because everyone here... And it's like, oh, it's so cold here. I mean, it is, but, it, you know, it really, there's cold. It's what winter is about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's cold places in the U.S. and Missoula, you know. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> all right. So uh, so speaking of mindsets about cold and all that stuff, let's talk about your mindset hack. So what is your favorite one that you practice or an innovative mindset hack that you might know of and like to share? So my drive to the gym is very special to me. As I said, I wake up at 4 or 6. Yeah, I leave the house about 4.30 and I start driving here. And if you if you come to the gym with me, I don't have anything written down. The drive here is how I practice my daily routine. So just practice being positive. I don't wake up and I'm positive. It's a daily routine. And drive here, I'm just thinking about, you know, be positive. What good thing happened the night before? What good thing can you look forward to? How can you make someone's day? How can you tell someone you're doing a great job? You know, just train your mind to be so mentally tough that nobody can touch your peace of mind. That's what I always talk about. So just how good you are. Wake up and just tell yourself, I got this. I am good enough to go do what I want to do today. You know, mm -hmm. drive that 15-minute drive for me is how I get my day started. So when I get here and get a workout in, I just feel like, you know, nothing can touch Yeah. Nothing can touch you know, so. Yeah. That, that daily routine, I really, really enjoy. And I mean, my wife even told me, so you know you don't have to wake up at 4 or 6 anymore, right? Because in the past, I had to get here early so I can work out and train people before I go to my actual job. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. I was getting up early. I don't have to, but I can't, I can't stop. Ah, I, I just, it's part of you. Part of me. Like, I have to get up and come do it. And I, I think everything that's happening for a reason, I thank God for this because I've been very healthy for the last 10 years to be able to get up and do it every day. A rarely a day or I'm, there is a day that I'm not here, you know, so yeah. uh, everything has to plan for you to be able to do right. it, get up every day and do it and just keep it going, mm -hmm. you know, and we all have our challenges, mm -hmm. but, you know, just when you know you're, you have is so much better than so many other people, you know, you can't sit here and feel sorry for yourself, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you and I know physically, I know, you know, more than a handful of people back where we're from that has it way, way worse than we do. You know, so I can Yeah. I would say I and I wanna my goal is to take my kids this year so they can actually go see it. Yeah. yeah. That would be awesome. Mm hmm Yeah, 
appreciate the stuff we have here. So I, I get up and I appreciate every single thing I have. And yeah. it's yeah. the driving force, yeah. force for me to just keep going. And I, I really like that you said that it's a practice, like positivity is a practice. Because I think we sometimes get lost with, you know, the things that are practiced, like, you know, these tangible things, right? But the but the concept of like positivity as a practice, I think it's priceless. So thank you for that. Yeah, for sure. I I did get comment about how, you know, you're you're so lucky, you are just always positive. And I'm not lucky. I just practice. Well you know, I've worked so hard, you know, like I get up and practice just like everything else. How you practice being positive. You practice being nice. All of that. Yeah. Exactly. All of yeah. that. Start practicing one day at a time. Guess what? At some point, it just becomes who you are. I'm going to tell you a quick story about uh, one of the ki- middle school kids I trained here. And he came here talking about, um, he walked in and his head is down. He's all bummed down. I was like, hey, what's going on? He's like, oh, it's Monday. I hate Mondays. And I'm like, why do you hate Mondays? You're middle school. And he's like, I don't know. Oh, so he's just learned to yeah. practice something that is not even, wow. Exactly. He said his parents always said they hated Mondays. You see? So I'm like, careful what you say around your kids, right? The kid hates Mondays and he doesn't know why he hates Mondays. You know, so I'm like, this is when we want to change that mindset. Yeah, yeah, you hate something about it. My kids hate broccoli and veggies. They had never tried it. You know, just like that. You know, you don't even... <laughs> <laughs> it's like, where? It's like, uh, no. You're not yeah, allowed yeah. until you really can form an opinion. Let's put it that way. Yes, for sure. So I'm like, don't be putting stuff like that they see or hear it. And they think it's okay. Or he didn't even know why he was mad about Monday. I, and that one that really blew me away. So I just told him, hey... Just treat it like every day, man. If, if if you have a good day on Thursday, let's have that same attitude and good day on the Monday because you just feel lucky you're actually coming here. To, you know, that kid loves working out, you know. So I'm like, parents are paying for you to come out here and work out. You know, why why treat this day differently than a Thursday? There you go. Yeah. Going back to the kids, that's what I love. I love being able to teach these kids like this kind of moments. I love it. So we've learned all about you that is working, but not working because you love it. So yeah. so when you're not at the gym, we want to know, like, who is gay when he's not at the gym? Are you a reader? Are you a watcher? Or are you a listener? And what are some of your favorite reads, watches, or listens? Or, you know, if it's not any of those things, what what who are you out of the gym? Yeah, I've never been a reader, but thinking this to wifey kind of helped me. Um, start reading more. Back to back to the roots. I was not never a good reader. I struggled reading and writing to about sixth, seventh grade. But this book I just picked up, or well, not just picked up. But I was a Kobe guy, so I picked okay. this Mamba mentality book. Something I'm very interested in, and something talks about mindset. So I do read that. I also picked up the Eric Thomas just came up with the You Owe You book. And that's another one I picked up. And not a huge reader, but I do read those. Inspirational types of mindset works, yeah. I have my whole notepad in my phone and my iPad. Is I call it my 406 Bible. That is filled with inspirational quotes, everything inspirational. That's what I read every day. And that, wasn't, that really matters to me. Nice, nice. All right, so are you, are you going gonna, gonna to ink that? Do we see a book a book coming out of this? Yes, you might see something out of that. I I think at some point I want to be able to share my whole story yeah. about how all this became about because it just yeah. I just be, didn't become four or six out of nowhere. I just didn't become this person who yes, yeah, se- nineteen years ago, this seventeen year old who barely knew how to read or write. I remember a story my host mom told me, you know, right after she dropped me off at school on my first day. I looked back and she was bawling her eyes out. And she thought after after a while, she's like, I didn't know how you were going to do it because I could barely speak English. I could barely write. I could barely, I mean, I was quiet. I just, you could do it. And I'm so proud of me. And she tells me every day how awesome I'm doing. So like, it, it's It's been a long journey, but I'm very, very, very blessed to have gone through all that. And that's why you're a local citizen. I'm so happy to host you. I just love the the inspiration you have and your attitude. It's great. It's so great. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, I mean, I, and even, I mean, our local basketball team here, the Grizz, you know, I meet, I meet kids like, you you know, your your nephew, Jonathan, and 
into the African roots right away, man. Super respectful, super awesome. And, you know, I mean, yeah. and it's just an instant click. And I just try to be mentor to them and just be, you know, some kind of bright light because I know what it is to not have family here. Mm-hmm. Help my mm-hmm. sister cook for them. They come over and just you know, experience a little bit of African yeah. food, you know. So, so I just I just love being the, the person for those guys. when they- Nice, nice, nice. And we appreciate you. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, I want let them know just anything I can do. Just let me know if I can help. I have. Wonderful. So I know that you probably have clients coming and, you know, the, the workout starting because the end of the day is coming for the little ones. So could you share some some parting thoughts with our audience? And also, where can we find you? Yes, you can find me on IG at 406 AM crew. Mm-hmm. You're going to get your daily dose of inspiration, daily, daily dose of motivational speeches, daily dose of workouts, all for free. And follow it for the right reason. I always tell my kids, social media can be really good for us. It, it can also be bad for us. So be mindful of who you follow. And this should be a practice for everybody. If you open your social media and the first thing you see doesn't inspire you, make you laugh, or make you feel some type of way, you shouldn't follow it. So if you open is someone, something something that makes you feel a type of way in a negative way, don't follow it because it's not for you. Uh, yeah, your social media is for you. So get on so you can, you know, just let loose and just have fun with it. So if the first thing doesn't make you feel that type of way, don't follow it. For your friends, if you don't like what they're posting, it doesn't mean you're not friends still. You know, yeah. You don't, you know, and the one thing I just experienced with some of the kids, you don't have to like everything your friend posted. I mean, if it was, it's so negative, why are you liking it? You're still friends. You just don't have to put yourself in that situation. So first thing you see, if it doesn't inspire you or make you laugh, don't follow yeah, it. I like that. I like that. Those yeah, are yeah. great. Those are great parting thoughts. Thank you so much for that. Oh, all right, local citizens. This has been another episode of the podcast. You can catch us Tuesdays with new episodes at localcitizenspod.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, send us a review, follow our guests. And until next time, folks, bye for now. <laughs>